You have been at CETA for almost four years now. Um, how do you view CETA today? Four years at CETA, I think we have uh, grown and we have evolved. We have grown definitely in the financials. I think that if you look at our numbers, you will see that our profit has grown 40% in four years. And that's something that's really amazing for a company that is uh, the leader in the market and has been under significant, I would say, commercial pressure mm -hmm. from our competition. But we have also evolved. We didn't stay in just growing ourselves. We tried to grow the market as well. We have become much more extrovert than before. With our competitors, we are actually now more partners rather than competitors. And, and we're doing our best in order to actually make the whole technology market of Cyprus a much uh, a bigger and better place for everyone. So I'm sure you're proud of uh, the financial results of CETA, but if I had to ask you, um, what, what are the achievements that you are most proud of? Hmm. Um, okay, definitely the financials is one <laughs> of them, but... but um, I don't know if people know this, but um, CETA is probably the only public uh, service company that has a proper performance management system. You know, in the, in the, in the public sector, all the people are um, evaluated as excellent. They all get top marks. So CETA, for the last two years, we are not like that. We that's have, one of our greatest issues as a country, actually. I think, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think it is. It, 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 and that's why it was, it, it's the biggest achievement that we have managed mm -hmm. to do. That's why I feel so proud of it, because it, it was not easy. Um, if you're used to being the best or considered to be the best for all your career, if one day you wake up and somebody evaluates you and tells you that you are not really what we have been telling you or what you thought, and there are other people that are better than you or that they, they perform better than you, then you get a culture shock. And uh, that wasn't easy. But for the last two years, we've, uh, we've managed it. And I'm, I'm very proud that our people have, uh, have embraced it. And uh, they feel proud, I think, as well, that they are the only um, entity in the public sector of Cyprus that they have a proper performance management system. How did CETA manage to be certified as the fastest mobile network in Europe in uh, 2021? Mm. It wasn't easy. Um, if you remember in 2020, when the first lockdown happened, the news was uh, that uh, some uh, radio antennas uh, were being set on fire yes. back then because yes. they thought that we are going to um, install 5G while the people were at home. Now, that was, that was really tough for us because we weren't actually doing it uh, and uh, people needed communication at the time. And do you play poker? Because we were all working from home as well. I mean, you, we were, we were. Yeah. Do you play poker? No. You don't, okay. <laughs> in, in, in poker terms, we could have folded back then. We could have said, okay, we're not going to do anything. Yeah. If the people are you know, complaining, they're burning antennas, we're, we're just going to lay low. We did the exact opposite. We went all in. So what we did was that we started a really aggressive network rollout. And during the two years from 2020 and 21, we've installed 5G in the whole of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. And we're the only country in the world that has 100% population coverage of 5G, the only country in the world. And because of that, we have been uh, evaluated by UCLA, which is the, the top evaluator in the world, uh, as the fastest network in Europe for 2021. And, and that's not easy, because if you think which countries are in Europe, yeah. that's, that's not yeah, easy at yeah. all. So uh, little CIDA has uh, the fastest network in Europe right now. And, and although I shouldn't, my marketing is going to be a little upset now that I'm, I'm going to say uh, what I'm going to say. We have been um, awarded three days ago for the second year running as the fastest network in Europe. So we are the fastest network in Europe in 2022 as well. And that's really amazing because to do it once, maybe people will say it's a fluke. Uh, to do it for the second year running, be the fastest network in Europe, it's, it's, it's really something. So I'm, oh, I'm very well proud done. of that. Thank well done. You.
I'm trying to see where your marketing department is sitting to see it's if sitting anybody somewhere. has they fainted. Are, they're, 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 okay. no, they are not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to be happy. <laughs> yeah, Alexandra. <laughs> is there a secret to the success that CETA has had in the last few years? Okay, I, I got this question many times, and I used to say it's the people that mm. is the secret, it's, it's the people of CETA. But I feel that this is a little bit um, generic and uh, maybe unfair. I need to qualify it a little bit more. There are some amazing people at CEDA that have carried the company on their shoulders again and again and again over the, over the years. They know who they are. Um, we keep telling them. And that's, I think, that the, the secret of our success. It's not all the people. But there are some really amazing people that are, have been doing it without any profit. They're not going to make more money. It's just that for the love of, that they have for CEDA. That's I think why they're doing it. This is what I was going to say. I think it's a matter of loving the company that they work for it, yes. it, and, making it, and making people feel that the company that they work for is their own. Yes. When you feel it's your company, even though you don't own it, you, you work harder. Do all companies need digital transformation? Um, I mean, for example, a plumber or an electrician, a tailor or a bar uh, barber, mm. <laughs> why would they need to deal with the digital world? Uh, actually, you said plumber, and I, I keep having this conversation with my plumber many times. <laughs> yeah. um, he's asking me the exact same question. I, I, he says, I'm okay, I don't need anything. Why, why all this technology and stuff? And, okay, for, for or him, a farmer, I mean, yeah. Yeah, basically which is even more. <laughs> yeah. in, in Cyprus, there's a lot of professions that I don't think they understand the value that technology can bring uh, to their business. Um, my, my plumber thinks that digital is asking me to send him pictures of my broken toilet over Viber. That's, that's what he thinks is yeah. digital transformation. And that's, that's where he sees the limit. And I'm, I keep telling him that, you know, that's not really what you can do. I mean, there, you can differentiate yourself from other plumbers. If, for example, you were able to offer online booking of appointments, okay, how many plumbers in Cyprus right now, they have an app that you can actually go there and book your appointment whenever the customer wants. So you mm -hmm. can see the plumber's schedule and you can find, I want to book it tomorrow at six o'clock or maybe in three months at six o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, not many plumbers are doing that. So if the first one that's going to do it is going to get a lot of Digital customers, digital educated customers are going to love this. I hate talking on the phone to mm -hmm. uh, get a service. I love if there is an app that I can just book everything and not talk to anyone and then everything happens automatically. So how many people are like me? Probably a lot of the audience are like me. Um, and certainly so. the next generation will be more uh, adapt to this sort of way yeah. of working instead of picking up the phone and yeah. talking to somebody. Um, where does digital transition stop, and are we entering an age where everything will be digital? Look, the, the more time we spend on uh, the digital world, I think the more we appreciate uh, the moments that we have away from our screens. Hmm. I mean, I'm talking about real people, real feelings, real things. I think the longer this digital evolution is going, um, it's going to get uh, much more valuable for us to have physical experiences because we are physical beings. Mm -hmm. we, we eat, we drink, we sleep, we fall in love. This is what characterizes us as people. So I think it's, it's important to remember that the digital world and the physical world need to coexist, and, but we need to um, understand better what we use each of the worlds for. I mean, digital is for convenience and efficiency. But if we want uh, feelings, if we want depth, if we want balance, we need to be more physical. So what you're saying really is to use the digital technology and all the, the, the transformation, the transition that is happening to our use and not let that use us, yes. basically. And, and that's really a very difficult thing to do because yeah. we tend to, um, let it to erase the lines us. between, <laughs> yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. What would you advise an SME technology company in Cyprus? 
huh, um, to disrupt the market that they're in. I mean, this is the, the, I, I believe this is probably the easiest thing to do in Cyprus. We, we, just like the example I said with the plumber before, I mean, all the SMEs, they are in an industry, and the industry in Cyprus is usually quite conservative. We are not really very adventurous or very, I would say, customer-centric in how we develop our companies and our services. So I would definitely advise SMEs to think out of the box, to go and improve their customer experience, to go the extra mile and introduce the wow factor in their services. Uh, the example I gave before with the plumber is, is, is a good example. There are many things... Oops. Very nice. It's okay. <laughs> it's good luck. Disruption, yeah. Guri, guri. We were talking about disruption and I've managed to do that. So, yeah. So, yes. So, basically, um, the, uh, the, the art is to manage, to disrupt yourself and the industry that you're in. And a lot of companies are not really comfortable in doing that because they're afraid. But if they don't do it, another competitor will do it. And that's the and thing that they are not... they'll be left behind. Yeah, they'll of be course. left behind. Of course. Yeah. Uh, what would you advise the state on technology and digital transition issues? To be faster, to take decisions faster, to take more risks. Mm -hmm. I don't think we are taking a lot of risks in Cyprus, in... Uh, especially in the public sector. I think we always try to get everybody to agree, all the stakeholders. Doesn't matter how important they are, doesn't matter how many people they represent, we want to get everybody to agree as if we're going to be elected again. Yeah. Okay, and that's why we're, we're trying to get everybody to say, okay, that's wrong. You cannot implement transformation by getting everybody to agree. And sometimes maybe we need to stop thinking about the next election. Or what other people think. Yes, and start thinking what people will think five years from now, ten years from now. Because the things that we might do, maybe they cost us our position in the next couple of years. I felt that many times mm -hmm. in the decisions that we're making. But I think that in the long run, you will be remembered with much more value if you actually... Uh, go ahead and do the, the bold things, the risky things. Okay. I'm looking at the time at the same time because I'll get slapped <laughs> if I don't keep to the time. Can a semi-governmental company survive in a highly competitive environment? That's a, that, that's a difficult question. Uh, because CEDA has been able to do that, people are saying, oh yes, this proves that other semi-governmental companies can do it. That's not correct. The, the, the reason we have been able to do it is because we have done a lot of things that we shouldn't have done, that semi-governmental companies are not supposed to do. So we have taken risks that maybe in five years' time the Auditor General is going to come and uh, tell us that you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, and you you're going to... You shouldn't have said that. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's going to do it anyway. So, yeah. but, so you might read some things later in the papers that are going to say, ah, a company like CEDA shouldn't have done that. But in the end, if you don't do it, you do not survive. So you have to make some difficult choices. And not every public sector company is able to do that. But they really need to do that if they want to be successful. Does the increase in the cost of electricity affect CETA? Could we see price increases for CETA services? The, the cost of electricity affects CETA. I see my friend Adon is there, the CEO of EAC. Yeah, but um, recently, you... you downgraded the, the prices for CETA. We, we, uh, that, I that's got what a I message. Was say. Yeah, I that, got a that, message. That's, that's what, look, if, if you look saying at the that last, my package is cheaper now. So, yeah. in, in the last three years, we have reduced prices 60%. Yeah. Okay, in the most popular packages. So, really, I don't know any other utility that has been able to do that um, for, for the last period. So, people are complaining about prices, but, um, and definitely it's difficult for us to pay more for electricity, but we will absorb this. We, we have the capability to absorb this. We have the loyalty of our customers that they have uh, been uh, with us all these years. And a lot of business customers that I have seen today, I feel very strongly that I, I need to say thank you for, and I appreciate their loyalty. But um, I think we will continue with uh, 
reducing prices rather Investing than Investing green energy and solar panels. That's we, your next. We are doing that as <laughs> that's well. That's your that's next. What can we expect from CETA in the coming years? We're going to invest in building more emotional connections with our customers. We want our customers to keep feeling about CETA the way they feel right now. A very strong emotional connection, a connection of love and loyalty. And we're going to have a lot of digital experiences as well. I mean, we're going to announce uh, a few of these experiences in the next few days, but I'm not going to say anything more because I think I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to survive, I think, the day if uh, I say anything. Uh, they're looking at you. Tell us something we don't know about CETA. CETA doesn't have any bank loans. It doesn't give, it doesn't get any help from the government, any help from the state. And actually, it pays every year about a third of its profit in the form of dividends back to the state. The money that CETA gets we get it from our customers. So what you need to picture is that there are people in Cyprus that are not CEDA customers, that they don't give anything to CEDA, any money, but they get something back from CEDA, from the dividend mm -hmm. that we pay to the state, because that goes to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So not all taxpayers are CEDA customers, but they still get something from CEDA. That's something that people, I don't think, no. uh, yeah. know. Tell us something we don't know about you. I'm an introvert. I guess you play poker because you know poker. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I do play poker. Uh, but I, I, I would say that I, one thing that people don't really um, figure out about me is that I'm an introvert. I, I don't like social interaction very much. It takes a lot of energy out of me. And then I need, uh, after all the social uh, experiences, I need time, me time to, to recover my energy. And uh, I do that usually at night, and it's good that I live alone because it helps to, to recover. I've got time just for two very quick questions, uh, otherwise I'll be beheaded. What is the biggest challenge you had to face as CEO of CETA during these four years? I think the biggest challenge is entering an organization as the first person from the private sector to lead it. Um, to be challenged on a daily basis from everyone within SIDA, whether I was capable of actually doing this and having to prove every day uh, that I was. And that was really a huge challenge for me, but uh, it's something that I feel that uh, uh, the, the people that I have met at SIDA, the people that I work with, um, I enjoyed it. They are enjoying our uh, working together and I'm looking forward to, you know, more experience. And finally, is there a decision you had to make that you regretted later? No, I, I don't regret any decisions. Of course, everybody makes mistakes and everybody has taken decisions that are, have been proven to be catastrophic sometimes. Um, but what you need to do is that you need to revisit them and you need to play the devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, question yourself and see what you can learn from them. But no, no regrets. No regrets. Thank you. Thank you very much.